Hello everyone, welcome back to my channel. In this week's video we're going to be looking at five great works of fiction in the fantasy genre. Number one is the fourth novel in the Wheel of Time series, that is The Shadow Rising by Robert Jordan, published in 1992. In The Shadow Rising, we follow our protagonists as they take us to some of the far reaches of Jordan's world. We follow Rand, Matt and Egwene as they journey to the Aiel Waste to meet the Aiel, a mysterious warrior race all but unknown to the wider world until this point. Meanwhile, Perrin returns to his homeland, the Two Rivers, to defend it against those that would destroy it. The Shadow Rising is often touted as one of the best books in the Wheel of Time series, and also one of the best fantasy books of all time. This is the novel where Jordan really lets the reader know just how epic and huge in scope his series is going to be. Not only do we get a detailed introduction into the Aiel, one of Jordan's most original and complex races, but we also get developments in things like the magic system, where we start looking in more detail in the world of dreams. We also start to get more of a picture of the Forsaken, with the introduction of Lanfear and Megidian playing a more central role in the story. Another thing that, in particular with this book, that puts it high on the list for me, is that it is one of the books where all of the plots that we follow keep my interest pretty much from start to finish. Particular favourites for me are Perrin's character arc in The Two Rivers, not only does that culminate into one of the best battle scenes of the entire series, but it also has some really well done character development for Perrin. Also worthy of mention is Nynaeve's character arc in this book, which results again in a pretty cool battle, a power battle between her and another character. This is not only usually one of the best power battles in the whole series, but again it has an impact on Nynaeve and her character going forward. Overall then, The Shadow Rising has some spectacular um, world building, it has great character development, and some of the most climactic moments of the entire series. Moving slightly away from high fantasy now, for the next item on this list, we have Clive Barker's Imagica, published in 1990. Damn it, 1991! Imagica tells the intertwining stories of three characters. John Fury Zacharias, known as Gentle, a master forger whose life is a series of lies. Judith Odell, a beautiful woman desired by three powerful men, but belonging to none of them and Pio Pa, a mysterious assassin who deals in love as well as death. These three are united in a desperate search for the heart of a universal mystery, and will find the truth that lies in a place as mysterious as the face of God, a secret as the human soul. They discover the Imagica. Now for those of you who prefer high fantasy as a genre, and don't maybe don't like urban fantasy so much, I'd recommend starting with this novel if you haven't read it before. Though Barker takes his time unraveling his magical, mystical realms, once we get there, he pretty much matches high fantasy authors like Robert Jordan in terms of the complexity and scope of his world building and the worlds that he creates. In addition to that world building, this novel also has some great characters whose story arcs are just completely unpredictable. It's amazing how quickly they go from this real world storyline to something completely magical and outlandish and just crazy. When I was reading this, I really couldn't predict what was going to be happening to them, what their backstory was, or any of it. But what was also really good was that when Barker reveals these things to you about these characters, when he reveals his worlds, everything fits perfectly into place. I also like that he spends so much time with the characters in the real world before getting to the more magical side. It really allows you to build a bond with the characters in a way that it's much more difficult to do in something like high fantasy. Because these characters are embedded in a world that's very similar to ours, it allows you to connect with them on a much more human level in a much more easier way because you have a shared context from which to develop that relationship with the character. If you do read this and you like it, I'd also recommend another of Clive Barker's books, The Great and Secret Show. I've just finished it and it was going to come on this list, if I'd have finished it maybe a little bit quicker, it might have superseded a Magicka for this list. But for those of you that really prefer high fantasy, if you want to give more urban fantasy a try, I'd begin with a Magicka, because it has so many parallels to high fantasy, in terms of the scope and depth of its world building. Okay, time for a slightly sentimental pick, um, but number three is The Silver Chair, written by C.S. Lewis and published in 1953. The Silver Chair is the sixth volume in the Chronicles of Narnia series. In The Silver Chair, Prince Rillian, only son of the now aged Prince Caspian, has gone missing. Aslan, the lion, sends two children from England to Narnia to solve the mystery, Eustace Scrub and Jill Paul. Travelling with the warm-hearted, though pessimistic, marsh-wiggled Puddleglum, their adventures take them all across Narnia, taking them to a castle of giants and then to the underworld. 
So this novel is one of those novels that kind of has a lot of sentimental value for me because it was a novel that I grew up with as a child. They were also definitely the books that captured my imagination as a child and drew me into the fantasy genre. The reason I picked The Silver Chair rather than, say, The Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe is because I think it's an underrated gem in the series. Another reason that I picked it was that a lot of people complain about the Christian imagery in The Chronicles of Narnia. This has never been something that bothered me because I knew these books when I was so little that the messages just kind of went over my head. I also just don't really have any strong feelings about religion, so it just doesn't really affect me. However, I do find that in The Silver Chair that Christian message is pretty low-key, if it's even there at all. But the main reason that I like this novel is nothing to do with the religious stuff and everything to do with the central relationship in the story. The relationship between Jill, Eustace, and the Marshwiggle Puddleglum is one of the most endearing and most intimate relationships in the whole series. Part of this, I think, is because they just have great chemistry with each other. The character of Puddleglum is this kind of cynical, miserable old man, but he has a heart of gold and really cares for these kids. It's kind of like two children traveling around with their eccentric, crazy uncle. I also found the villain in this story, the Green Witch, one of the more sinister villains in the series. The way she tries to manipulate and hypnotize the characters is way more creepy than the White Witch, say, who is just very boisterous and loud and just kind of, you know, out there. The Green Witch is much more subtle and sinister in a way that a lot of the other villains are just more cartoonish. Now, if you've not read The Chronicles of Narnia before at all, I probably wouldn't recommend starting with The Silver Chair. It's book six chronologically in the series. They weren't written in order, but there are some things that it refers to in previous books so that you probably want to read those books first. If you are somewhat familiar with the series, which I imagine a lot of people are roughly familiar with it, I'd give this one a go, because like I say, I think it's underrated, I think it's really good, and if you have a bee in your bonnet about the Christian stuff, then this is one of the books where that doesn't really play into it all that much. Okay, moving far away from children's fiction for the next number on this list, which is The Infernal Desire Machines of Dr. Hoffman, written by Angela Carter, and published in 1972. Set in an unspecified Latin American country, the novel features Desiderio, a government minister in the main city currently under attack by Dr. Hoffman's reality-distorting machines. Desiderio embarks on a journey to find Hoffman's former physics teacher, eventually bringing him to Hoffman's castle. Rejecting a caged yet eternal fulfillment of his sexual desires in the form of Dr. Hoffman's sexually ambivalent daughter, Albertina, he kills both the doctor and his lover-to-be, thereby restoring reality. So, quick point about the synopsis. Um, that didn't contain any spoilers, because the entire story is spoiled for you anyway on the first page. This isn't a novel where the plot really matters at all. In fact, the off-the-wall crazy shenanigans in this novel are far more shocking than anything in that synopsis could ever have been. Some of you may also be thinking that this seems more like a sci-fi novel than a fantasy novel, but I think when you read it, you'll understand why it's on this list. First of all, Carter uses several tropes from the fantasy genre. The narrative is very much a fantasy adventure story in the kind of classical fantasy vein, and she's definitely subverting and messing around and playing with those classic tropes. There are also several creatures and magical elements that definitely again appeal more to a fantasy crowd than to a strictly sci-fi crowd. This is probably the most difficult novel to read on this list. Now, Carter, as I said in my gothic fiction video, has a very distinctive style, but she dials it up to like a thousand in this book. Not only does she use incredibly verbose and complex language, seriously sometimes this reads more like a continental philosophy paper than it does a novel. Now all of this makes sense in the context of the novel. You have these machines that are distorting reality and making everything basically go completely mad. You have people's sexual fantasies melding with reality, sometimes to horrific consequences. You have these crazy libertine characters that are straight out of a Marquis de Sade novel at points. Centaurs that have this religion where they sort of worship crap. However, if you can get through the incredibly strange writing style, get your head around some of the crazy shenanigans that go on in the book, it's definitely fulfilling and worth a read. Carter is using this crazy tale to talk about a lot of interesting things. One of the main themes of the novel is objectification and desire, and how these two interact with each other. She also asks philosophical questions about the distinction between reality and mere appearances, and how much our desires shape reality. So definitely, if you like off-the-wall fantasy, give this one a try. Last on my list is something that's probably a bit of a cliche. It is a Harry Potter book, but I wanted to talk specifically about this book because I think it's an underrated book, so why the hell not? The book I'm talking about is the second book in the series, Chamber of Secrets, which was published in 1998. 
In this novel, we follow Harry during his second year at Hogwarts School of Witchcraft and Wizardry, during which a series of messages on the walls of the school's corridors warn that the Chamber of Secrets has been opened, and that the heir of Slytherin would kill all pupils who do not come from all magical families. These threats are found after attacks which leave residents of the school petrified. Throughout the year, Harry and his friends Ron and Hermione investigate the attacks. So at first I really wasn't going to include a Harry Potter novel, but when I was doing a bit of research for this list, and I was looking at how people rank the Harry Potter books, I realised, to my surprise, that the Chamber of Secrets tends to come quite low, usually last on people's lists. Now this surprised me because growing up this was one of the books that stood out to me the most. One reason for that might have been because when I was a kid I was an absolute wimp and hated everything even slightly scary. And basically this book scared the crap out of me as a kid. But I didn't put it on this list because it gave me nightmares when I was a kid. I put it on this list because I think there are lots of things in this book that make it one of the better books of the series. First of all, unlike the first book, whose plot is pretty much irrelevant to everything that happens later on, but in the second book, the plot and the elements of the story all have huge implications for the later books. You have the introduction of the Whomping Willow, the introduction of the spiders, you have the Basilisk's Fang, the Horcrux introduction, you have the introduction of this concept of mudbloods and purebloods, which becomes of huge significance in the later novels. There's just so much in this book that's laying down the foundations for what's to come. I think one of the reasons maybe why this book gets overlooked over the first one is simply because the first one is the first one and it introduced you to the world, and they do sort of have a similar structure. Harry goes to school, there's somewhat of a mystery going on, and he solves it by defeating Voldemort at the end. That being said, I think that this is the better version of that story. First of all, the stakes in this book feel way higher than they did in the first book. You have something going around petrifying students and possibly killing them throughout the school year. To me, that makes the characters feel a lot more unsafe. It also makes for a much more dramatic and involving story overall. Overall, I think this is an overlooked gem in the series, but please let me know in the comments below. Do you think it is overlooked, or do you think actually it, it should come at the bottom of the list because the other books are just miles, miles better? Okay, that's it for today's video. If you enjoyed this video, please like and subscribe for more content. Also, let me know in the comments below, what are your favourite fantasy novels? In terms of future videos for the fantasy genre, I'm thinking of doing a Wheel of Time review, and possibly maybe around the same time, or maybe not depending on how much uh, I get into this, but I might be doing an analysis video on the Wheel of Time as well. So be on the lookout for those videos, and I'll see you then.